All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Psycho Splatters, always powered by coffee each and every time. Maybe asking yourself, hey, Psycho, what are you going to do today? Well, you know what? It's that time again for a future award-winning show, Chewbox from Hell. That's right. So if you saw last week's episode, which uh, we analyzed uh, Return to Zero, which uh, had some former Boston members on it, um, go check that out if you haven't had a chance to. But we're not going to talk about that today. Today, we're going to go to September 1983, <clears throat> and we here are going to go off and this is episode 47 of jukebox from hell for your scorecards the september 1983 album the third one from the joe perry project once a rocker always a rocker that's right so before we get into this huh, here's your record collecting standpoint here here's your front all right here's your back which shows the rest of the band and by the way on the back it says no synthesizers were used in this album. Your MCA label is going to look like this. All right. Your bluish, rainbowish, kind of, for September 83. So this is the third album, like I explained before. Uh, the last album that was done was in 81, and it was called I've Got the Rock and Rolls Again. Uh, that one made it to number 100 on the Billboard chart. This one didn't chart at all that's right oh boy okay i'm gonna try to shorten this up a little bit here if i can and i'll explain why uh you have a complete lineup change uh between the second and the third album here okay charlie farron's gone he was the vocalist for the second one and of course the rest of the band that was on the first album and the second album are gone and now you happen to have on vocals Cowboy Mock Bell, that's right, otherwise known as Mark Bell, really, but Cowboy Mock Bell, who previously was singer to a band in Boston called Thunder Train. I looked into them a little bit, and what little I could find seemed fine. Danny Hargrove on bass and Joe Pett on drums, that's right. Oh, boy. All right, so look. I listen to this thing, right? Front, back, forward, sideways. Ugh. Listen, I'm an Aerosmith fan. I'm a Joe Perry Project fan, too. That first album with the music do the talking, really good stuff. Even that second album's got some decent stuff on there. This, on the other hand, oh, Jesus. Okay. Out of, out of the tracks here, all right, out of the tracks... You've got Once a Rocker, Always a Rocker. That one, really great song, seriously. Black Velvet Pants. No, all right? And, and MCA was a dumbass. MCA was a dumbass. They put that as the video. Now, in, the, in the, if you've ever seen that video, it's very cheesy, okay? Paid video extras, and, and you get the first appearance of the future um mrs joe perry uh on do, playing the sax okay <sighs> oh my god just go look for it you'll see what i'm talking about but they should never have stuck that as the single women in chains four guns west crossfire for side one side two adriana king of the kings bang a gong that's right t-rex cover how about not and say we did? Power Station did a better version of this, okay? Seriously. Walk With Me Sally and Never Want to Stop. There's two really good tracks on here. Once a Rocker and Never Gonna Stop. Never Gonna Stop has got that Bo Diddley vibe from beginning to end, okay? Honestly. And that was great. Now... I think personally, Cowboy Mock Bell was the wrong choice for singer. I think the album would have been maybe a little bit better if he wasn't the singer on it. It's true. Um, there was some unreleased tracks that were recorded. Six of them, according to what I read. Uh, I had I, for your research today, Joe Perry's website some Joe, Joe Perry project in the Steve Hoffman forums, uh, wiki and all music. All right. 
So the six tracks, when worlds collide, first one's for free, going down, they'll never take me alive, into the night, and something else. So unfortunately, I tried to do a little detective work. And I couldn't find going down or into the night or something else. Now, when worlds collide and going down, both were performed in early 1983 tours, dates on the Joe Perry project. All right. Something else was actually done live during the Joe Perry project album tour. All right. Got that. Okay. Now saying that though, the three tracks that I could find when worlds collide, I wrote February, 1982 demo with Brad Whitford. This should have been on the album. You betcha the damn thing cooks. All right. Two first ones for free, Joe Perry sings it. Now, there's only a 30-second clip on there on YouTube, but it sounded great what I heard. And then lastly, They'll Never Take Me Alive, another killer track that should have been on the album. And I'm going to tell you right now that if those three tracks would have been on this damn album, it would have definitely improved, and it definitely would have charted. That's for sure, okay? Um, so... Hang on. So, <clears throat> page three. There was a tour, like I brought up, uh, with the same lineup. But I I read somewhere that possibly Ronnie Stewart, who was the drummer on the first two albums, might have come back on drums at some point in the tour. Also, the tour being late 83, early 84, Brad Whitford was added to the tour lineup. So, yeah, you got Joe Perry and Brad Whitford. Brad, of course, left just at the start of the Between Rock and a Hard Place. Uh, he only shows up on Lightning Strikes for that Aerosmith album. Um, this album here only sold around 40,000 copies. That's it. Uh, they did tour at times with Huey Lewis in the news. So, uh, February 1984... Joe and Brad met the rest of Aerosmith. April 1984, they end up rejoining Aerosmith, which ended the Joe Perry project at that juncture. Now, there is a live concert late 1982, New York City with Mock Bell, so you could get the idea of how it sounded like live. It was grainy. I didn't care for most of it, okay? Supposedly, Mock was better live than he was, at least in this studio album, all right? And there's a short live 1983 clip somewhere on the East Coast, I'm told, of the band doing Discount Dogs, which was a track off of a previous album, which originally was going to be called Discount Drugs, but they, the label wouldn't do that. Um, and then, of course, like I said, the video for Black Velvet Pants. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> like I said, I'm an Aerosmith fan. I'm a Joe Perry fan. But ooh. so did you end up getting this thing? Or did you at least see the video for Black Velvet Pants? Did you get to go see Joe on that 83-84 tour or any of the tours for the Joe Perry Project? What's your favorite album or song? Mine still would be Let the Music Do the Talk, and I think that was the best song out of the whole three albums, seriously, and the Joe Perry Project 80s run, okay? So, um, never saw this thing in a cutout rack. Uh, I just happened to trip on this, found it in a, in a mall at an antique store. I'm like, oh, you're coming home with me. So, yeah, two tracks out of 12. Really, really good. Um, so... Next one. This is actually a request from Mellow D. Yeah, I told him eventually I was going to get to this. The next episode of Jukebox from Hell, episode 48, we're going to go to August 1991. And we are going to investigate the first LP from Mr. Bungle. That's right. Yeah, we're going to go that direction. Um, the next time for Psychos, Platters, Jukebox from Hell. Now, are you enjoying this series? There's a little bit of wiggle room left for any requests for this season, and uh, which will go to episode 50. We're going to finish it off at. And, uh, 
But, you know, just let me know in the comments if you cared for this album and or if you're an Aerosmith Joe Perry fan. Till next time, guys. Take care. God bless. Always part of the coffee each and every time. That is the mighty psycho promise. And thank you for watching and take care.